everyone, welcome to Anchor Church. I'm Alyssa and we're so happy you decided to join us today. Here at Anchor Church, we'd love to help you develop your unique spiritual giftings and grow in your relationship with God. We know that God created you on purpose and for a purpose, and our heart is to help you discover and live out the life God intended for you to live. So if you're new to our church and want to be known by us, just text the number on the screen and we'll help you get connected. And if you need prayer, please text that same number. Have you ever thought about leading a connect group? You might not realize it, but you are already leading those around you. Do you and a couple of friends talk about God together? That's already a group you participate in. In January, we will be launching new connect groups. So if you're interested in being a connect group leader, please text the number on the screen. Starting on Christmas Eve, we will be live streaming our Friday night service. So join us for our live stream here on YouTube on Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. After 6 p.m., the service will be available for future viewing. You are also invited to join us for our in-person services at 6, 8, and 10 p.m. With that, we are going to enter into worship right now. Dear God, thank you so much for this time we get to worship you. We pray for everything in our week ahead of us, and we pray that you bless this worship tonight. In your name I pray, amen. Good. 
You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working We make a miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness Hey guys, I'm going to be praying for the tithe and offering, but before that, we have a great testimony by Issa Purrington, who is the wife of Noah Purrington, our very own missionary in Barcelona, uh, who you support. Uh, she's going to tell a story of some hard times that hit, uh, continue to tithe, and God came through. So check it out. Hey, I am Isabella. I am married to Noah Purrington. We're both missionaries in Barcelona, Spain. So tithing um, has been easy when I've had a steady paycheck, which I used to have before the pandemic. And it's been really challenging uh, once a pandemic hit. Um, we live in Barcelona, Spain, and we were in lockdown for two full months and every single business closed. Um, so a lot of people, including me, we lost our job. Um, and I had to look for ways to earn money because that that same year, I was also getting married. Um, so there was a lot of pressure and a lot of insecurity and a lot of stress. Um, but he's always faithful and he always provides in ways that we would never think or imagine, but that's how he shows his glory and power and how he is in control. Um, you know, he would always show up even when I, I thought like, oh, you know, this month is gonna come short or we won't be able to find an apartment or we won't have uh, money to buy the furniture for that apartment. Um, but God made a way, um, he was so faithful and uh, we were able to qualify for an apartment we didn't think we were gonna qualify for. And then all our furniture, um, we were able to get all our furniture. Uh, there was this missionary couple in Barcelona who recently arrived and they had to get all their furniture from Ikea. And Ikea accidentally, well, accidentally, they um, doubled their order without registering. So they had double of everything in their home and they couldn't get it uh, back to Ikea because they didn't have a register. So they couldn't come pick it up. And they had heard about us, how we were moving into this new apartment and they knew this was a blessing from God. So they gave us everything. They had mattresses, bed frames, chairs, tables. And we didn't think God would show up in that way, but um, we serve a great God, right? And um, sometimes He doesn't show up when we want to, but He for sure shows up and He does great things and He gives us the desires of our heart. And um, He just asks very little of us. He asks a 10% to be committed to be, um, to trust Him with that 10% and that He is our main provider and He always shows up. Wow, what a great story from Isa. Uh, the one thing that stuck out to me was that she had some hard times. She got married, um, but still tithed 
And God came in an unexpected and a timely manner. And here's the thing that hits my heart is that, you know what, I've been a tither for a while and I've seen God come through in so many unexpected ways and so many timely things came right when I needed it. And you know what, you might be in that same exact position. And I want to encourage you still worship God through the act of tithing, Uh, especially those guys who you took up the 90 day challenge. I want to just encourage you to keep on going, giving to God, Um, be faithful to him and he will be faithful to you. So let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your promises uh, that we that, that when we give to the storehouse, Lord, you will open the windows of heaven. You did that for Isa uh, in a miraculous way. You've done it in my life and you will do it in all of our lives as we continue to give back to you what you have already given to us through our tithe and offering and use it for your glory. And Lord, you're going to provide for us and be faithful to us as well. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. We all pray. Amen. Hey everybody, welcome to Anchor Online. Merry Christmas. Can you believe that Christmas is two weeks away? Hey, I just wanted to remind you real quick, just get, to get some business out of the way. Um, Pastor Rob, just a, as a reminder, Pastor Rob is taking a special offering uh, the last two weeks of December to reach our community. So pray on it. Ask what God would want you to give to that. Don't feel pressured out at all to give to it. But if God is putting something on your heart to give to this special offering, I pray that you'd be obedient to what the Lord is telling you to give. Um, so Christmas is two weeks away. Like, can you believe it? Have you got all your Christmas shopping done yet? Is everything on Amazon? Are you going out into the craziness of the mall? I think uh, my wife and I, we're, we're pretty much done. We did all of our, our shopping early. Now we just got to wrap them all. I think we have a couple more presents, but it's right around the corner and Christmas songs are in the air as well. Do you love the song, Angels We Have Heard on High? I'm going to kind of burst your bubble a little bit and bust a myth. In the song, Angels We Have Heard on High, actually angels are not sweetly singing over the plains. Um, As we learned in our Angels and Demons series a while back, you can watch it uh, on our archive section on our website or YouTube. Pastor Trevor Carpenter tells us that angels don't sing, they proclaim. They're warriors. They're not little tiny cute cherub babies. They're actually warriors and messengers of God. And in this song, Angels We Have Heard on High, I just want to kind of give you some insight, a cool fact that I found online and the history behind the song, Angels We Have Heard on High. Many years ago, in the hills of southern France, uh, these shepherds had a Christmas Eve custom of calling to one another, singing Gloria in excelsis Deo, which means glory to God in the highest, each from his own hillside. The traditional tune that the shepherds used may have been from a late medieval Latin choral. It became the magnificent chorus of angels we have heard on high. How cool is that? But Christmas songs in in the air, Christmas shopping is happening, and we can get caught up in all the to-dos of Christmas and lose a little bit of the wonder. Maybe this past year, just life got the best of you. Your, your routines, your schedules got the best of you and you kind of got numb to what God is doing in your life and you lost a little bit of the wonder. I wanna give you some encouragement. If you're in the valley right now, you're going through a hard time, this message is for you. If you're like on the mountaintop and everything's just amazing, here's a chance for you to recalibrate your life to reassess and reevaluate the rhythm of your life with God. I want to give you hope right now that you can recapture some of the wonder in your relationship with God. Again, Pastor Tom talked about the definition of wonder. It's a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. A great adventure is what makes a, a, an adventure so great is that when you start out, you're stepping into the unknown. That's what makes it so so exciting, is that it's unfamiliar to you. And if we re- recalibrate our lives and learn to live in God's rhythm, we can live a life full of wonder. Because God is all about the new, the unfamiliar. He wants to take you to new places. He wants to do something unexpected in your life to take you to new heights with him. So as we look into God's word right now, I just want to pray and ask that God would speak to your hearts in the, in the way that you need it. So let's bow our heads wherever you're at. Lord, we just ask that as we look into your word right now, God, that your Holy Spirit would move, that you would speak through the words that are in, um, in the Bible. Lord, that it would come alive for everybody hearing this right now. Lord, that we'd find encouragement, Jesus, through your word and through um, who you are, the character of who you are, God. I pray that you would challenge us and that you'd move us forward. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we're going to be talking about shepherds today. In Luke 2, 8 through 20, we're just going to read it. If you have your Bibles, if you have a Bible app, open it up to Luke 2, verses 8 through 20. This is the NIV version that I'm reading from. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. Not singing, but praising him, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were they were just told about. So we're talking about the shepherds today. This, this story is all about, this sermon's all about the shepherds. And I just want to give you some backstory on shepherds. Uh, shepherds, Luke's gospel is the gospel of the poor and lowly. Uh, just if you didn't know this, uh, Luke was not one of the 12 disciples that Jesus had around him. He was actually a doctor. So his, his, uh, his gospel is just, it's robust. It's, it's really full. And Luke talks about these shepherds. And it's actually the only place that you're going to find shepherds in the Christmas stories in the, in the Gospel of Luke. Um, so about shepherds. Shepherds in Jesus' time were considered unclean. In Christ's day, shepherds stood on the bottom rung of the Palestinian social ladder. They shared the same on a, uh, status as tax collectors and dung sweepers. Shepherds were officially labeled sinners, a technical term for a class despised by people. Only Luke mentions them. They represent sinners for whom the gospel is intended. Now, how crazy is that? That the angels and God reveals the birthplace of Jesus to this low class. I think it's so encouraging that, you know, Jesus is all about re redeeming, about reclaiming, about repossessing, about saving. And the very occupation that was despised by religious leaders being reclaimed by Jesus and, and later being used as a beacon of hope. Later on in the Bible, it talks about Jesus being the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, and we would look to him as someone who leads us. We're called the sheep. We're his flock, but he's the good shepherd. And if we recalibrate our lives and learn to live in God's rhythm from this story, I, I, I I just want to challenge you. We're going to look at three things that we can take away from the shepherd's life. There's a rhythm here that we can live a life full of wonder again. We can recapture some of that wonder in our relationship with God. So the first thing, if you're taking notes, um, I want you to just write this down. To recapture some of the wonder in your life, to get a good rhythm, it's all about positioning. Step one is position. The shepherds were positioned in a place to have a powerful experience with God. They were outside of the city, the Bible says, probably away from people's opinions, uh, distraction, they, and they were all uh, the only ones that were probably awake at the time as well. They were alert and awake. So I want to challenge you. Prioritize to spend some alone time with God. What are you doing to get away from all the distractions, all the, the opinions, all, all the, the stuff in this life? What are you separating from so that you can spend some time alone with God? Be mindful in, in your language of prayer. You know, um, sometimes I find myself just asking God for things like, God, please, could you do this? God, I need this. God, would you come through on this? And would you like to hear the prayers that if you were praying to yourself, would you like to hear those prayers? I can just imagine uh, hearing that from God like, oh, Trevor, give me this thing. Oh, Trevor, I'm in financial help. Uh, I, I need financial help. Trevor, do this for me. Where God wants a real relationship with you. He just does, he doesn't want, he's not a genie in the bottle, okay? He wants a real authentic relationship with you. And so part of that is listening. 
part of that is asking him, God, what do you want for me today? And if you're into, if your relationship with God is all about talking about yourself and asking for things, your intimacy with God may be on the back burner. I want to read you guys this scripture in 1 Kings 19, verse 11 through 13. This is about the prophet Elijah. And now Elijah's on the run. People want to kill him. So he's hiding out in this cave. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mountain cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so often in our life, when we're going through something, when we're like caught up in the rhythm of life, or maybe we're, um, we're throwing a pity party for ourselves and we're hiding out in the cave. Now, I, th- I think this is real interesting that the Lord wanted Elijah to turn away from the darkness of the cave and go to the entrance of the cave. And I think that's so cool. I think that represents, you know, uh, us sometimes. We love to just look at the things that are in the dark, the darkest things, the negative things in our life when God wants us to experience him and go out into the open. The Lord wasn't in the wind or the earthquake or the fire. He's in a gentle whisper. And he wanted Elijah to turn from the darkness and meet him out there. And later on in that that scripture, uh, the Lord gives uh, Elijah direction for his life and a mission. So maybe that's you today. James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So this, um, this concept about God not being in the big loud things all the time, but he's in a gentle whisper. The proximity, the position of where you are determines how well you can hear God in your relationship. Um, My daughter Nova is going through this phase right now. Um, I don't know if this happens with all kids, but she has this thing about whispering and she'll do do it to my, my wife and I all the time. She'll be like, dad, come, I gotta tell you something. And I'm like, what do you want, Nova? What, what, what is it? What do you need? And she's like, no, you got to come down. Come, come here. Come. And I'm like, uh, so I'll, I'll play along and I'll, I'll get down by her and I'll, I'll put my ear out. And she's like, she'll say, I just want some cookies. Something like that. Something ridiculous. But she won't tell me unless I get to the position where I'm right next to her, uh, where, where she's going to be able to speak to me. The position actually determines how uh, the relationship goes and the intimacy with, with God. Are you positioning yourself in a way where God can speak to you away from all the distraction, all the worry? Um, there was also this one time recently this past year, I was really troubled about something. I was bummed out and I was talking to my wife about it and I decided to go on a walk around the block and I put my, my headphones in and took a walk around the block. Actually, it was like a really long walk. I think I walked like three miles that day, but listening to worship music and just being outside walking. And as I walked and as I listened to God and allowed the worship music just to minister to my heart, the Holy Spirit calmed me down. God gave me some insight and actually kind of worked it all out. And my heart was at at peace with what was going on. What are you doing to position yourself in a way where God can speak to you? When was the last time you got up early before anybody else and opened your word and got into it? When was the last time that you just grabbed a coffee and took a drive around the island just to spend time with you and God? Position is so important. The second thing that we can learn uh, about the the story of the shepherds is that they pursued. Okay, if you're writing uh, any notes, just write pursue. The shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The shepherds pursued Jesus. Have you allowed the the pace of life and the promises of the world to lead you away from the passion of God? I know that in my life with kids and and work and um, trying to prioritize my relationship with my wife, sometimes things get out of whack and it can lead us away from this intimacy and this passion of God. Don't stop pursuing Jesus. We can pursue a lot of things in this life. We can pursue a great career. We can, pers- we can pursue uh, a husband or a wife. We can pursue 
happiness, but God is unshakable and he's unchanging. The shepherds left their very own flock, the things that they, that, that they, uh, that, that revolved around their life was the sheep that they took, they looked after. They would actually give their own lives for the sheep and, pr- and protect them, but they left their very own flock to pursue Jesus. When I was, um, before I started dating Sarah, I set up this, this date with my friend, Jeremy, and he was the kind of the third wheel, but we went to his house and, um, we're watching some movies and my whole plan was to, uh, flirt with Sarah. And then at the end of the night, I was going to ask her out. So we're, you know, flirting the whole night. I'm like in my stupid boyish way, I'm like throwing pillows at her and, and pushing her and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, so the night ends and I walk her to her car and I, I asked her, Hey, Sarah, would you want to be my girlfriend? And she says, yes, I'd love to be your girlfriend. I pick her up and spin her around and then say, okay, bye. <laughs> I went back to my car. It was a real awkward moment where she went to her car and uh, opened her car and drove home. I went to my car and just drove home. I didn't know what to do at the time. I was a youth leader in high school. So I'm like, let's keep it clean. Probably should just go home. Uh, and that was it. But what would have happened if that was the end of the night? Like I never called Sarah again. I didn't take her on any dates. I didn't pursue her. But I just lived in that moment where she said yes, and there was this deal that was made, and uh, she was my girlfriend, I was her boyfriend, and I told everybody, hey, yeah, me and Sarah are dating, uh, she's my girlfriend. Hey, did you know that Sarah's my girlfriend? And I proclaimed about it, but I didn't have a pursuit and a relationship with Sarah. Some of you have said yes to Jesus, and your relationship with him is a little sour. You have you haven't called him up. When was the last time you called Jesus up? When was the last time you called God up and said, hey, let's hang out. I want to talk to you. Just because you accept Jesus in your heart doesn't mean you can stop pursuing him. Those of you that are in high school and you go to camps, the camp high, when you're like having this amazing experience at camp isn't enough. If you came to the worship night on Thanksgiving Eve, the worship nights will never be enough and they won't cut it. If you're going to a Christian conference, the conference won't be enough. Just church on a Sunday isn't enough to build that intimacy with God. It's a daily pursuit of Jesus in his word with a real relationship with him. I want to read you some scriptures just to kind of back up my point and encourage you. Luke 11:9 9 through 10 says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Amos 5 verses 4 through 6 says, for thus say the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me that you may live. Psalm 22 verse 26 says, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. And Proverbs 18 uh, 8, 17 says, I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me will find me. Pursuit. It's such an important thing. Having the experience with God is good. We got to position our, ourselves where we can experience him. But after that, we got to have a daily pursuit of Jesus and build that relationship with him. That knowledge like of God's character, who he is, getting in the word. It's so important. And the last thing that we can pick out of this story of the shepherds is proclaim. If you're writing notes, write down proclaim. When they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told to them about this child. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen, which were just as they had been told. After a powerful encounter with God, after pursuing Jesus, they proclaimed what they knew about God. What are you doing with your experiences and your knowledge of Jesus? Are you keeping it to yourself? Are you just treasuring things in your heart and just holding it in? A powerful experience that you've had with the Lord, your relationship with him. What are you doing with those things? Psalm uh, 96 verse three says this, declare uh, his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. We have to proclaim who God is and his glory to other people. Not just non-Christians, but Christians as well. It's encouragement for the body, but God wants everybody to know about him. And there's some ways that we can proclaim, right? We can proclaim by 
uh, our lives, just our lives, the way we live. People can look at your life and know what you're all about based on what you like and your desires. Is your life just like the world's? Does it look like how other people live? Or is it in contrast to what the world looks like? Is it attractive in a way that's life-giving? Does it look different? Romans 12 verse 2 says this, this is Paul speaking. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's got to look different. You got it. Your life has to look different than the world's. Otherwise, why would people want to follow God if you look exactly like them? There's no, that there's no hope in your life for, uh, for a future. People want to know, is God real and is hope real? And does your life reflect that? Another way that we can proclaim is by our testimony, words, what we say. How was your life before? What encounter did you have with God? And how is your life different after you had that encounter with God? Do you know your one minute testimony? You know, growing up in this church, um, we would go on Japan mission trips. And one of the things to prepare for the Japan mission trip was to go around the circle of all the people going on the trip and just share our one minute testimony. Hey, how did you come to the Lord? Because uh, the pastor at the church that we were going to in Japan was just famous for just busting on people and asking them, hey, share your testimony. We could be like in the train station and he'll, he'll talk to some person and, and pull one of us aside and be like, hey, Trevor, please share your testimony right now. And you had to be ready. And if you didn't know it, you could mess it up. Do you know your testimony? Can you share it in one minute? If you had an opportunity and this is your only chance, do you know your testimony well enough to share it without messing it up? Don't just stand on a street corner and just like start sharing your testimony. That's, that's another thing I kind of want to encourage you with. Um, be tactful with how you share and where you share your testimony. Pray and ask God, God, who do you, what's your assignment for me today? Who do you want me to share my testimony with? And I just want to tell you that it's not just about um, your salvation story, coming to Jesus for the first time. It's not only about that. If God isn't doing anything in your life recently, and you can't find any fresh testimony, you got to ask yourself, how fresh is my relationship with God? And I want to encourage you, if that's you, maybe just start back up at the top. Just get back into the top of the rhythm and position yourself in a place where you can experience God in a real powerful way. And that after you experience him, that you'd pursue, that you'd confirm your relationship with Jesus in his word, that you'd have a daily pursuit with his word and a real relationship with him. And if we recalibrate our lives and learn to live in this rhythm of positioning, pursuing, proclaiming, positioning, pursuing, proclaiming, that we can live a life full of wonder. We can discover that God has new adventures for us, that we can discover that God has new things in store for us. There's always something new with God, a new experience with him, who he's about, a new revelation through his word, or maybe it's a new opportunity to be his hands and his feet and to proclaim what he's done. I just want to pray for all of us right now. So if you just bow your heads and I'm going to pray for uh, a group of people that maybe you're struggling in one of these areas. And I just want to, I want you to turn to God right now and ask him, God, what do I need to do to position myself in a way that I could experience you in a real powerful way? Maybe it's to pri prioritize spending alone time with him. Maybe it's going on a walk. Maybe it's just listening to him and not just asking for, for stuff. Maybe it's a walk on the beach. Maybe it's just sitting down, whatever it is. God, I pray that you would just speak to these people right now about what it is they can position in their lives to experience you. Maybe you're a group that is um, just struggling with the pursuit of Jesus in his word. Maybe you feel a little bit stale. God, I pray right now that you would reveal to them what it is, that you would challenge them to pursue you on the daily, that they would get into their word on the regular. Lord, in this last one, the proclaiming, God, I pray that people that have experienced you and pursued you and that have a real fresh relationship, God, that they wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Lord, that you would provide opportunities for them, that they would be bold to share their faith. They'd be bold to share about the things that you're doing. And God, that you would empower them to just 
spread your, your word and who you are among all the people, Lord, all the people in their life. In Jesus' name. And I'm going to pray for a group of people right now. Um, you've never said yes to Jesus in a real way. <clears throat> Maybe a friend uh, told you about Anchor Church and you're just, you're, you're logging on and you've never said yes to Jesus in a real way, but you're hearing this and you're like, wow, this sounds like God can give my life meaning, purpose, and hope. I didn't know that God loved me that way. I didn't know that God loved me so much that he would send his one and only son to die for me. And if that's you, I'm going to pray with you in a moment. But I just want to explain the gospel, the good news. The good news is that you don't have to pay for your sin. That this gift of salvation isn't done by works or good deeds or how pure you are. But it's simply because Jesus loves you so much that he loved you so much that he would come to this earth, fully God, fully man, that he would show us how to do it, that he'd walk this life, not sinning even once, that he'd live this perfect life, that he would eventually go to a cross, that he would die a criminal's death, that he would put all of our sin, past, present, future, on his shoulders as a sacrifice. And going to the grave for three days, and on the third day rising from the grave, from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit for once once and for all, defeating death and sin in our lives. And all you have to do, the Bible says, is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you'll be saved. You'll be a child of God. You get eternal life with Jesus. You get the Holy Spirit who's called the Comforter and you're adopted into the family of God, which makes you his child, his son, his daughter. So if that's you, I just want you to pray this prayer in your heart. If that's you, just let's just pray. God, I, I just want to say I believe in you and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for living life my own way, for doing things on my terms. But right now in this moment, God, I acknowledge you. I, I acknowledge that you came to this earth for me, that you went to that cross for me. And I accept this free gift. Jesus, I right now in my heart believe that you are God, that you're my Lord, that you're my Savior and I commit my life to you. I wanna live for you this moment forward. And I just pray as I give my life to you, that you'd surround me with people that know you and love you, that they would put me on the right path. And as I get into your word, God, that you would just show yourself to me, that you'd show me more of who you are, your character. And God, that I would find a church, if it's not Anchor Church, I'd find a church that I would be able to be plugged into, that I would grow in your word, your relationship with God and others. But more than anything, Jesus, I love you. I give my life to you and I commit myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if that was you that just prayed with me, congratulations. It's probably the best decision you'll ever make. Um, here at Anchor Church, we want to help resource you and partner with you in this journey, in this new relationship with God. If that was you, just text the number on the screen. We'll get a hold of you and give you some next steps on how to pursue this new relationship with God. Hope you enjoyed the message. Hope you were challenged. Thanks for joining us today. See you next week. We love you guys. Take care. Thank you, Pastor Trevor. We were blessed and encouraged by this message. Also, if you said yes to Jesus, congratulations. This is truly the best decision you can make. We wanted to remind you that if you jumped in later in the message and missed the chance to participate in the offering, no worries. There are three easy ways you can worship God through your finances below. Thank you for joining us today. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you can know every time we go live. We love you and we can't wait for you to join us again next week. We pray you have an amazing week.
the light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you Oh.